Good morning. Welcome once again to H2O Church this morning. We are nearing the end of our taboo series. We have been digging deep uh, for about a month, month and a half at uh, subjects that you would never expect to hear at church. We began the series talking about sex and sex abuse. We moved on to sex and sex addiction. We discovered the topic or discussed the topic of homosexuality, gender issues. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we took some time to unpack the idea of the forbidden fruit and, uh, and the saran wrap, the covering, the images that were in the, uh, in the logo or the, the, you know, the video and whatever and the little papers. We, we unpacked that and tied those, those into the crucifixion and into the resurrection. And today... We are going to be continuing the Taboo series, and I will give you guys one guess as to what the topic for today's discussion might be. Anybody want to throw a guess out there? Oh, thank you. It is actually written on the shirt. Uh, we are going to be talking about racism, and what we're going to be doing today is, is looking um, kind of historically about the topic of racism, look at uh, the church and the church's response. And I know what you're thinking right now. Because I am thinking the exact same thing. And what you're thinking is, isn't it kind of ironic? And maybe we would say a little awkward that we got the white dude from Georgia talking about racism this morning. Yes, believe me, I feel the uncomfortableness of this moment. However, what I would like to suggest and to kind of discuss this morning is that this really isn't about a white dude from Georgia talking about racism. What I want our time to be about this morning is to catch a glimpse, a little bit of a glimpse of some of the mistakes that the church and humanity has made as a whole with regard to racism. But I also more importantly want us to look at what is God's intention for the way that we as his followers, as his children should act and feel and think towards those that might be different from us. So today what we're going to do is we will look a little bit about the historical, uh, the, the history of racism. We will look at a couple, couple of scripture verses that try to paint a picture for how God would intend us to um, act and feel and think towards those that are different from us. And we will wrap it up um, by kind of drawing it all together and really not just getting a feel for what does God want, but we will see the end result as we look at a passage of scripture at the end. However, before we do that, what I want to let you do right now is take about five minutes to stand back up. You've been sitting for a long time, I know, so stretch your legs out. Say hello to someone you didn't get a chance to say hello to um, before we got started. So take five minutes just to say hey to those around you. I'm not 
want to grab your seats again, we will go ahead and get started. Now, I, I got to be honest that, uh, you know, even though this really isn't about some white dude from Georgia talking about racism, I feel this overwhelming compulsion, compulsion to uh, build some street cred with you, uh, to kind of set the stage for where I'm coming from and uh, just to kind of help you to understand how close to my heart this topic is. Um, Growing up in Georgia, it was not uncommon for me to experience or to see or to see the effects of racism in a very real way. Uh, we lived under, I, I say we as in those of us that lived in the state of Georgia, I feel like lived under the presumption that racism didn't really occur, which is just something that's absolutely ridiculous. Because it did, it does, and we'll get to that a little bit more. But I want to share with you what I feel like are some key experiences that I had with racism um, as I've developed my life. Uh, the first, my very first experience with racism, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't even really at the time, like really understand what was going on. I was about... Oh, third grade, so like maybe seven, eight, eight years old, nine years old, something like that, when my family adopted my youngest sister. And her name is Jenny, which is short for Genesis, and this is a, there's some pictures of her here. She obviously is not white. Um, she is actually biracial, um, African American or black, white, however you say it. I, I, I should do a disclaimer right quick. Uh, African American, that terminology is just awkward to me. So I'm going to say black. I really hope that doesn't offend anybody. That's uh, black, white. That's just the way I call it. I'm not politically correct. So please know I mean no offense by it. If you are offended, you can feel free to stand up and tell me right now, and I will do better. Okay? Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, and what happened is is that as we lived in this small ta- uh, small town of Winder, Georgia. Uh, we had an old school white judge that was the judge to do the final adoption. And as you can imagine where this story might be going, that when a white family came to adopt this black girl, this white judge from Georgia, small rural town, decided that it was not a good idea. And he actually denied the adoption and would not allow us to adopt my sister, who had been living with us for months at the time because we actually brought her home from the hospital. We are the only family that she has known. Um, And this was, like I said, this is one of those things that I didn't even really catch what was going on at the time. Obviously, we persisted and we went back and we, we made our case for why we should be allowed to adopt this young child. And we were granted the adoption, coincidentally, by the same judge who saw the persistence and was able to at least change his mind for this particular case. That was really the first, first instance of racism. And I, I don't point this out, um, or I do point this out, to kind of begin to paint the picture for what God's vision or intention for his kingdom is, for his people is. Because I feel like in that experience my parents began to model and give an example for us, the rest of us. I have three other, two other siblings. There's four of us all together. Began to give an example of what godly love and acceptance looks like in a very real and practical way. The second, a second instance of racism that really made an impact on me was later as an adult, um, Rhonda and I lived in Gainesville and uh, while she was in law school, and we decided to buy our first house. And as a lot of people do when they purchase their first house, they purchase the house that they can afford, and it may not necessarily be the house that you really want. But we ended up uh, purchasing a house that we liked that was definitely in our price range in a lower-income neighborhood. 
And that is a polite way to say that it was a black neighborhood, and we were actually the only white people that lived on the street. And that was really an awesome experience because it, it was kind of like uh, being able to, to, to live in a, in a nation and in a culture that I was not familiar with. Um, and, and it was really exciting to be able to, to, uh, to, to be there and to interact with people that were racially and culturally different from me. And it was just, it was, a, it was an awesome, great experience. But I remember uh, early on as we lived there, across the road from us was this older black lady that had lived there. I think she was, she was like grandparents' age. I don't know how old she was, but she lived there like her entire life in that same house. And she had grandsons that were like my age, you know, mid-20s, 30s, early 30s, something like that. And they would all kind of like congregate over there and hang out. She watched one of her great-grandkids on a regular basis. And there were four of them, and they liked to hang out at the picnic table in the backyard. And I had this car that was having all kinds of uh, mechanical, like electrical issues, and it, and it didn't want to start. But it was a five-speed, so I was like, well, if I can get it pushed fa- fast enough, I can pop the clutch, and I can drive it down to the shop. So I, I did, you know, what most people would do is I walked across the street, politely excused myself for interrupting their guy hangout time, and asked if, one, if they would be able to help me push my car out of the driveway to get it moving. Um, and it was kind of funny watching that scenario unfold because as I kind of like glanced around the table there, like the wheels were turning in each one of them and nobody really wanted to say anything until finally one of them said, you know, I just got off of work. I'm really tired. And then the next guy's like, yeah, my back is hurt and I, I don't think I can do it. And the other guy was like, and the other guy was just like, yeah, I got this like a bad ankle and thing. And so they all had like excuses for why they couldn't help. And I was like, okay, you know, I appreciate that. You know, you know thank you. Um, maybe next time around. And I, I turned around and I walked back across the street to my house. And I remember thinking and feeling as I walked away, that's because I'm white. And that was kind of like really one of the, the first experiences that I've had being on the other side of it and really thinking to myself, this really sucks because the only reason they decided not to help me, I mean, I'm assuming a lot, I understand that, was because of the color of my skin. It's interesting though, there happened to be another black guy just walking down the street, saw me pushing my car into the road by myself who stopped to help and then as before I realized it, these four guys had got up from the table and came out and were also helping. And I, I, I like this story because it doesn't end there. Because we lived in that house for another couple of years. And we got to the place where we really had a great relationship, not just with that old lady, but with every one of those guys. That when they would come to pick up their grandkids, they would specifically stop and make time to come across the street if we were outside and talk to us. And we were able to develop a very nice relationship, but it started in an interesting place. I read this last week an article that was written in Relevant Magazine um, by a guy named Mike Foster. Maybe you've heard of him. He's uh, with the group People of a Second Chance. He wrote an article on five labels that we really ought to remove from our vocabulary and not call people anymore because of the implications that go along with it. One of those five terms was racist. And I want to uh, read for you briefly here um, what Mike Foster had to say about that. He says, if you want to hurt someone's feelings, you've got labels to choose from. If you want to be mean, insensitive, smug, or juvenile, you've got labels to pick from. If you want to damage someone's reputation, you've got labels to pick from. But if you want to do all of those things and sound righteous while doing it, then call someone a racist. You see, it's hard to defend against and it's almost impossible to shake if it's shouted loud enough. It offends virtually everyone out there, and it harkens back to times and places that we'd all rather just forget. It's not just a loaded word, it's a loaded gun. And I think that Mike hit it right on the head as he's displaying the heaviness 
of this subject. Before we go any further in this, I would like for us to have a word of prayer. God, you know that I have uh, been wrestling with this all week. Lord, you know I have been feeling the, the weight and the power of this message. God, I ask that as we are gathered here this morning, that you will be amongst us, that you can speak to us through your word, that we can catch a glimpse for your vision for how you want us to treat each other. God, it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Are you guys ready for the understatement of the day? You ready for this? Racism has been an issue for a long time. Yeah, see? It has been an issue forever, I would even probably argue. Racism was an issue in the early church. When the first uh, Christians, after Jesus had ascended back into heaven, they weren't exempt from this issue of racism. racism. They weren't exempt from having problems with dealing with those that were different from each other. If you look at Acts chapter 6, verse 1, we see very clearly right here. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, or the ones that were Greek or Gentile in nature, those were being converted... Among them complained against the Hebraic Jews. And the Hebraic Jews would be the traditional Jewish people, the Israelites that came specifically from the, 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 the Jewish uh, history. Be, they were complaining to the, the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Let me just make sure we catch what's happening. The Greeks, Christians, were saying that the inherited Jewish Christians were overlooking or forgetting about the Greek Christian older ladies, okay? And what's not said here, but what is said between the lines, is that that was happening because there was a difference in race and culture. One of the very first issues that the church had to deal with was this issue of racism. This isn't something that just cropped up overnight. In, in our culture and in our church culture. This is an issue that we as Christ followers, we as human beings, have been attempting to deal with for a long, long time. Racism was a big issue in the early stages of American history. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. We are all familiar with, the, with the, 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 the slavery that occurred in early America. We are all familiar with how people were treated worse than animals. They were treated as subhumans. And then even, almost even more grotesquely, in an attempt to treat people equally, but to keep them separated. It was a feigned, fake attempt to say that we're going to allow you to be treated just like the rest of us, but you still can't drink out of my water fountain. What is that about? We live in a fallen world, so it ought to be no surprise to us that racism continues today. We may be lucky enough to live in a bubble where we don't experience racism on a daily basis. But I would actually say if you're lucky to not experience racism in some way in that you see it occurring in your friends or family's lives or that you see it playing out in your life or that you don't get a feel for the tension that is in our, in our country, in our world between the differences of cultures and of races, then you are living a sheltered and closeted life and shame on you for not subjecting yourself to people who are different than you. We live in a fallen world where sin reigns, 
And as long as we live in this fallen world with sin, sin is going to abound. And sadly, racism is going to be one of those sins that is going to be here that we are constantly going to have to fight against. Racism is an intellectual issue that keeps droves of people from considering the gospel message. Droves is an out-of-the-ordinary way to say tons, lots of people. Because for many people, what they do from past history is they will associate the church with racism, with close-mindedness, and with bigotry. And I got to be honest with you. I got to be honest with you. It makes complete and total sense to me why they do. The church that I grew up going to, we averaged probably, uh, you know, around 100 to 125 people. But it was strange because the building that our church was in, really, it, it could seat like 400 people. And I, I never was able to make the connection growing up as to why we had this auditorium that sat this many people, but we never had this many people. I, I don't know, but... It worked out well because each year in October, there was this, uh, I guess you would call it like a revival, maybe, I don't know. We called it this fancy Greek word called ekklesia, which is a fancy word that just means the called out ones. Um, anyway, we had this, this three-day evening, we'll call it a revival, that met at my home church, and it was all churches over across North Georgia, they would come together, and we'd bring in like this well-known speaker, and he'd speak, you know, for three days, and we'd have worship and, and, you know, teachings and whatnot. And I remember every year, I would get to hang out with this one kid that I didn't get to see that often, because uh, his dad was the, uh, his dad was the pastor at a church about 30 minutes away. I saw this kid at this uh, revival. I saw this kid at uh, camps and whatnot. So, I get to hang out with this kid, and this one year when I was in high school, he, he we go outside on a break, and, and he says to me, I, I don't even remember what he says. It was some, it was an off-color joke that it was something like, gosh, I don't even want to repeat it. It's so terrible. Uh, but he said something like, do you know how you can tell... Uh, a KKK member's family tree. And I knew that this was going south in a hurry right here. And I, I said, no. And he says, from all the derogatory term for black people that starts with an N, hanging in it. And I have never wanted to fight anybody more that day. And in fact, his little racist buddy was the only reason he didn't get his butt whooped that day. Because as I approached him, he stood in the way, pushed me back enough to get his friend out of there before he got the butt whooping of his life. So when I say to you that this is an issue that people have with the church, I understand that. Because I've seen that firsthand. That's bad news. The good news is that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way God intended it. And if we look at Galatians chapter 3 and we read a couple of verses here, we see exactly what God wants it to be. Galatians 3.26 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed, your, clothed yourselves in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. 
neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, one heirs according, or and heirs according to the promise. Pay attention. Neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, we are all one under Christ Jesus. All the same. And let me add some context to this verse here. Paul is talking about the Old Testament law and how it was in place to get us to realize our need for a savior. And then he shifts gears and he talks about the Jewish custom of baptism, the ceremonial washing. And then he starts to play on Christian, he makes that connection to Christian baptism. And then he goes and talks about this custom that, was a, that happened in the early church of where the person, as they were being baptized, they put on this white robe to symbolize the new life that they were in Christ. How they were now pure and everything had been washed away. And then at the very end, what he's doing here is something that's absolutely radical. And that everyone who was Jewish who read this passage, this letter that Paul wrote, would know exactly what he's talking about. Because a piece from the Jewish morning prayer says, God, I thank you that you have not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. So Paul takes that very common prayer that he would have prayed, no doubt, days of his life, years, as a Pharisee before he became a Christian, and he turns it on his head and he says, there is no difference in Christ. Wake up and realize we are all the same. Sinners who have to have A Savior die for us. None of us is any better than the next. None of us. Honestly, there are many sins that the church as a whole body has committed. There are many sins that are what we would call a black eye to Christianity. But I think what happens sometimes is that we don't get the whole truth. You see, we know, obviously, that during the Civil War and the time of slavery in America, that there were slave owners who called themselves Christians and went to church on Sunday. We know that most likely happened. And we know that that's a black eye. But what we're not told is the other side of that. And we realize that... Slavery, particularly in England, and even here, was abolished because of the efforts of Christians. A guy by the name of William Wilberforce spearheaded the abolition of slavery in England. He was a Christian. He was a minister. He preached the gospel message. And he made it his purpose to abolish slavery. We're sometimes told the bad. We don't get to realize the good. And we're so overcome with the bad that we don't realize that isn't the way it's supposed to be. Just a minute, we're going to watch this video by a guy named John Piper, a well-known speaker, an author. And, and John Piper shares his story, his experiences with racism. And I think I want you to watch for this. The two most powerful things that he says, I think. The first thing he says is that sometimes racism gets so rooted in that it becomes a part, a a stealth part of our culture and our thinking that we don't even realize it until we're slapped in the face with it. So he says we have to watch out for it. But the second thing that, that I think is the most important thing that he points out is that the gospel message upon careful and close consideration has absolutely no room at all for racism. You see, my friend that almost got the beating of his life that day, several years later, when I hadn't seen him in that time period, happened upon me in Walmart. And he comes up to me and he says, I owe you a gigantic apology. (laughs) 
So at that time of my life, I was running with the wrong crowd. And I got to thinking and doing things that were not just wrong, they were sinful and shameful to God. And I beg for you to forgive me. What he realized is what John Piper realizes and what I hope we realize. The gospel message allows us to move beyond racism to embracing everyone in the way that God does. Let's check out John's story. One of the great sorrows of my life and one of the reasons I love the gospel of Jesus so much is because I grew up in this home as a full-blooded racist. It was an ugly time. It wasn't beautiful. It wasn't separate but equal. It wasn't respectful. Separate motels, separate restaurants, separate churches, separate restrooms, separate drinking fountains, right beside each other on the same wall. We couldn't even drink from the same fountain. What was that supposed to communicate? Separate public swimming pools. It was a cesspool of sin. And I was swimming in it. So I love the gospel. I love the gospel because it cleanses me from sin, forgives my guilt, imputes to me a a righteousness that's not my own gives me the Holy Spirit that begins to put to death the old racist nature and open up a whole new possibility of, of life and hope and joy and justice. in Greenville, South Carolina in the 50s and 60s was a racial experience. I moved to this house here uh, in 1952. I was six years old. That was two years before the famous decision Brown versus the Board of Education where the Supreme Court struck down segregation in public schools. Separation was was as deep as, as you could imagine and it was demeaningly deep. And I grew up in it with approval. I didn't look upon it with indignation. I looked upon it as the way things should be. In spite of the fact that I grew up in a a Christian home, there were real deep inconsistencies. And in this house, the closest I ever came to having any relationship with an African-American was with Lucy. I would wake up on Saturday mornings to the sound in this room of Lucy uh, chamoying. She would be squeaking that rag on this table right here or um, dusting the Venetian blinds. I could hear the crackle and there was Lucy. She came to the house twice a week and she was our, our maid. And we all loved Lucy, but it was relationally so dysfunctional. She was a, just a presence of another kind and one of the most remarkable things that shows some of the inconsistencies of our lives is that in 1962 my sister got married at White Oak Baptist Church and my mother invited Lucy and her family to come to the wedding. Well now this was going to create a, a tremendously difficult issue. What it meant was that Lucy and her family as blacks would show up and go into this church. There weren't any blacks at this church. And in fact, there was a tacit assumption and later an explicit statement that blacks wouldn't be welcome. Here I am functioning as an usher and they come. They walk into the foyer at the church. It's my job to seat them. And I don't remember who told me or how the message got to me, but the message got to me from somebody not in the sanctuary. 
I was about to usher them to the balcony. Nobody had ever sat in this balcony, ever. I didn't even know if there were pews up there. And my mother saw what was about to happen and took Lucy and her family by the arm and marched them right into the sanctuary and sat them down. Into my life were flowing these contradictory impulses. I saw my mother intervening against a system at that point which was going to further demean Lucy and her family. And so that was sinking down in. I remember another point on that porch that's just that way. The thought came to me, and I forget where it came from or who sowed it in my mind, but it was red birds mate with red birds and blue birds mate with bluebirds. So why can't blacks marry their own and whites marry their own and why is there this pressure to be together because in those days whether people articulated it or not and it's true today as well in many places togetherness meant your kids are going to start liking each other and one of them's going to fall in love with the other and they're going to marry and if that's your bottom line no that was the deepest justification in my sinful mind for all kinds of segregation. The next step for me was Wheaton College uh, after my growing up here in Greenville. Wheaton, it isn't the place where I finger decisive triumphs. I do have one remarkable memory of God touching me. I had fallen in love with Noel in the summer of 66, and we were heading towards marriage, and we went together. And in fact, we had the job of producing the newsletter at the 1967 Urbana Missions Conference. And Warren Webster, one of the mission executives who was there, during a Q&A, they actually did Q&A from, what, 9,000 students in the audience. And somebody stood up and said, now, you were a missionary in Pakistan. What if your daughter had fallen in love with a Pakistani? How would you feel about her marrying a Pakistani? He said, better a Pakistani Christian than a rich, white, American banker. And I thought at the moment, that is exactly the right answer. It's, it's, it's the family of Christian in Christ that matters. It isn't the ethnicity. It isn't the race that determines who the ideal spouse is or who you can and can't marry. So that one experience lodged itself in 1967, when I was a junior, pretty deeply inside of me. And then off to, to Fuller Seminary. In a class with Lewis Smedes on ethics, he let us choose our topic to write our semester paper on. And I chose uh, the ethics of interracial marriage. I studied it and I wrote the paper. I still have it in my files. And I concluded God does not, in his family, disapprove of interracial marriage. In fact, I argued, and I've preached on it since then, I think God blesses interracial marriage. I severed the root of that old issue of interracial marriage, which felt, as a teenager, like it was at the bottom of so much segregation. In 1971, Noel and I went then to Munich, Germany, where for three years I, I studied working on a, an advanced degree in New Testament studies. Not only were we in a, a country where we were, we were a minority, I couldn't speak German when I went. You feel like a first grader when you can't speak the language, even if you're working on a PhD. And so you tend to feel like, this must be what it's like to be on the outside culturally. And then we went to visit the concentration camp Dachau and uh, saw the ovens and the pictures and the old barracks with the cots, you know, three deckers high and thought through what, what was the meaning 
of Jewish people being rounded up and like cattle sent to the gas chambers. And I thought, this is, this is racism at its most horrific. I had now a, a son, Karsten, and my wife and I and Karsten moved to the only job that opened up to me after my graduate studies, namely a job teaching Bible at Bethel College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Increasingly, I felt a, a profound desire to preach the Word of God into a setting that would be more diverse, diverse in terms of age, simply, diverse in terms of, of socioeconomic, and, and maybe, if God willed, ethnically, racially. So in 19... 80, when God broke in, uh, he said, I, I want you to preach. So look for a, a pastoral job. The first church to contact me was Bethlehem Baptist Church in downtown Minneapolis. I'd never been there. I didn't know where it was, even though it was just eight miles from where I lived in New Brighton. I got in my car. I said, I want to go see where this church is so that I can wonder if I should even consider going there. To the west, was the high-rise, the ritzy downtown hotels and business people. And to the north was kind of a light industrial Valspar paint company. To the east was the university, 50,000 college students just across the highway. And to the south, Phillips neighborhood, L.A. Park neighborhood, the poorest neighborhoods in the city. And I thought, this is gold. I love where we are here. And uh, they called me. And I said, okay, if I'm going to minister in this neighborhood, I'm living in this neighborhood. And we, we looked for a house, found one within walking distance, about seven minutes away by foot. So we've lived there now for, what, from 1980 until 2011, 31 years in a neighborhood which is very ethnically, racially diverse and uh, have ministered the word. four children, four sons. We never had a daughter, and Noel always wanted a daughter. And then a phone call came. On the other end of the line was Phoebe Dawson. She's a, a social worker who worked with uh, women in crisis pregnancies, and she said to Noel, I have a little girl here. She was just born, and I think she's for you. Well, <laughs> You don't say that to a, you know, a 48-year-old mom who wants a girl unless you expect there to be some kind of earthquake. And uh, there, there was an earthquake. I mean, Noel hangs up the phone and looks at me and says, Phoebe thinks she has our daughter. <laughs> I'm 50 years old, and this daughter happens to be African-American. through the Arboretum and tried to assess our lives. What are our lives for? What, what are we going to do with the last chapter? And God did a remarkable work in us. He taught me this. He said, look, if you act consistently with your convictions about interracial marriage and the nobility and beauty of diversity, this choice would commit you to this issue till you're dead. And that swung it for me, those three things, love for my wife, love for this little girl, and love for the cause, the cause of, of Christ exalting racial harmony and racial diversity. Because if, if I lock in to my family the issue, this beautiful little woman created in the image of God and say, you're mine till we're, one of us is dead, then I won't ever be able to run away from this. And I wanted to draw that line in the sand in a decisive way at age 50. Then that's what I feel like today, that God has given us a, a beautiful 
and now Christian daughter who we're very proud of and whom we love with all our hearts and has brought alive a, a love for racial diversity and racial harmony in a, in a gospel-based and Christ-exalting way that I'm profoundly thankful for. decided to adopt Talitha, I wrote down in a letter that the fact that she's black is important. God made blackness, and yet that she is created in the image of God is, not to overstate it, a million times more important. When I look at her, I'm going to see human being created in the very image of God. And then secondly, down the line, I'm going to see a particular kind of skin or hair. That's huge. The Bible brings the image of God to bear on this issue, and it's massively important. And a second way the Bible brings it to bear is that it talks about there being one father of us all. All the nations came from one father, according to Acts 17, which means we're all related. You, you can't look with disgust or dismay or dishonoring on another human being as though they're not in the same family. They're in your family. If you try to demean them, you're demeaning your, your family. fundamentally a cross issue, a blood issue, a gospel issue that is at, at play here. And what's so amazing is how the gospel, by faith alone, having our sins forgiven, that gospel is the key to triumphing over these sins that militate against the advance of racial harmony and racial diversity. David wrote a psalm, well, he wrote, David wrote several psalms, actually, but he wrote one psalm uh, as he was uh, realizing sin from his younger days, specifically the sin with Bathsheba, but I think it is appropriate for us to remember today, Psalm 25, 7, where David says to the Lord, please do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, O Lord, are good. And I think that what I would hope for us to do here this morning at H2O is to be able to call out that same verse. That as Christ followers, as a part of the church, as a whole that has done a lot of sinful, wrong things, that we can call out and confess to God, God, please do not remember the sins of our youth. Not just with the sins of racism, but sins in general. I mean, specifically, as John Piper was saying, I think that we can come before the cross and know that when Christ's blood was spilled, that, that the cross, that experience, can redefine and revolutionize the way we think about racism. Let me wrap it up here quickly. The Bible says very clearly, I think, that we are all the same. There is none of us that is any better or different than the rest. Somewhere along the way, we've screwed it up. But as we look to Revelation chapter 7, what we are going to see here is a scene, I suppose, from heaven where it says that, and after John writes, after I looked, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, more people than you could put a number to from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, 
They were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So you have this scene here where it says, A number that you can't count. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every tongue. All of us are coming before God and we are praising Him and giving Him the glory He deserves. We're all the same. We've all made mistakes. But the beauty of the gospel message is, is it gives us the power to move beyond that and to worship God for who he is and how he has created us. We're going to continue on this idea of worship this morning. We're going to have the the praise band lead us in a few songs. And as they are leading us in the songs, the the ushers are going to pass out the baskets. And that's a time that that you could take your welcome card and you can fill that out. If you need to communicate to us, you can put that in the basket. The tithes and offerings will be taken up at that time. We will continue on right now, worshiping God continuing to worship God, praising Him, coming before His throne, as we are taking part of God's vision for the church, we are all the same, sinners covered by the blood of God.